these are, I think they're, I think they're because I thought they were interesting and brought up interesting points. So, the guy up, the one on the upper left, the first one on the upper left, actually did a lot right. They had, um, so they tried to do an open flow topology um, across multiple sites, and they were connecting them to your tunnel. And it's hard to tell from the picture, but it's basically a triangle topology. Topology of weave at three different aggregates, and then there's no something on the end, right? It's very simple topology, not too complicated. He tried it removing the link across the bottom, so it's just a linear topology, and that worked. And he's like, you know, and that was fine. And um, so he's left this thing up and down, and he's like, I can't get it to work when I have this system on me. And so we asked him, he like brought it down and brought a new one, so he got his accounts so we could log in, and we went and looked it around. Try a bunch of things and, and that, and we couldn't really figure out what was going on. And um, well, like I said, you know, it's incremental. He tried to route reasonable things. And we even asked him, Have you, you know, this is where we can do it as a single aggregate? Does your controller work with a single aggregate? And he, he thought he had it, right? And so that's good, right? This, this kid had done the right thing, right? So he had. Um, he has started to see well either, he has tested that, he has trained to multiple sites, he tried, you know, very simple technologies and he did you know layer technology and that was good. And when we went and when we pushed and we said, Are you really sure that this worked in one aggregate? He went back and it didn't. And then he was able to solve his own problem, right? And so I thought that was really interesting because he really tried to do the right sort of things. And um, but uh, it turns out that he missed his stuff. He thought something worked and it didn't. And so that double check was really important. And that once, once realized that, then the rest of the way. In the lower left, we have uh, this is also an open flow multi site topology. So it's brought here for the GRE tunnels. And, um, and that's fine. So the GRE version worked. Okay. And so we can just email asking how to stitch this, right? And this was a little while ago. And I think in particular, the node on the sort of near the bottom. That has uh, a thing on five. This five. This five. This five. Anyway, there's multiple. Anyways, there, there is sort of strange uh, stitching at the time, and I have this new features got her own stitcher um, as a result of this technology. And, um, and it turned out that, um, again, there was an issue with me to just control and delay on the loop. Right. And so, um, so, like, what's all this trouble to bring in this topology and bring the features out in? You know, cool, this is awesome, this is nice, and this is not my topology. And it did work because, you know, there was a step before that he perhaps um, would have lost to do that. I mean, I don't see that. I don't see that. They got perfectly. So, the one on the upper right is somebody who was trying to do multi site Hadoop. And um, Hadoop, as you know, um, or may you know, uh, has. These client rooms, the work rooms that send lots and lots of data to each other. That's either sort of the big data kind of application. And this person had used the control plane to send the, um, the data, high volumes of this data between their apps. And that caused problems with RAC, actually, right? And so this was really bad for us. And I think, you know, so this was a place where, you know, the the choice of sending high volume or the control plane was sort of a poor architectural choice, right? So these are sort of some sort of good things and bad things. And um, some like this little example like, sort of get things working, right? And so we're gonna talk through some things later and you'll see why I um, and I think there's sort of some that's a, there's sort of some things you can sort of draw from these that will happen. So real quick, um, so systematic experimentation is a little tricky and a little challenging, I think, because you have to sort of use your, your best practices and methodology, both for science, because you're performing an experiment, the science of the content, but also for programming, because you're probably writing a code, and also for system administration on, um, you know, sometimes a very large topology, right? So at the same time, you have to, you have to sort of use best practices on what three of these things if you want to do something. Of any um, reasonable size of complexity and scale. Right? And so that's a lot of things to do at the same time. And so today we're going to talk about some strategies and then particular concrete techniques about how to bring this experiment in a systematic way. Right? So when you think about scientific method, you think about 
um, multiple rounds of experiments, and I think doing this would definitely do that. But I think we're also talking about how do I get that technology at all? Like, how do I get, you know, 150 million technology working at all? How is that even possible, right? And I think they're very kind of right? And sort of how do you get from here to there, right? And then, I guess, a lot, we have a lot of questions on mailing lists, and um, of people who have been doing this a while, we have we've been burned a lot, and we have these sort of reasons, you know, burned into our souls about, you know, why we should do things a certain way. And but I think if you have, you know, been burned, you know, a thousand and one time, it, it can be easy to mess. So what are some motivations here, right? So one, we truly, truly believe that doing things in a sort of systematic way, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, really makes it easier to develop experiments, right? You know, if you have something that works and you change one thing, you know, it's pretty, you know, it becomes much more straightforward on how to do that. It's also easier to talk to somebody else and get their help across the It's very good about the phone. Um, in terms of scaling things and being able to repeat things, you know, if you're not um, doing things in sort of, you know, systematic ways or you can track what you're doing, you're just, you're never going to be able to scale. You're never going to be able to repeat in the way you're doing. Um, also, um, this is how you get sort of a, sort of a, how to validate your experimental setup. You know, you're running an experiment, so you have to understand your tools. And so we're going to talk about sort of how you under, sort of doing these things will allow you to understand your experimental setup. And of course, um, at the end, hopefully you'll have something rigorous to, um, so that you can get Okay, so that's sort of like why are we here? Let's talk some concretely about how to go about joining systematic experiments. So we're going to start with three principles. One of them is do one thing at a time. All right. So if you're right, if you're doing an experiment, you always change one variable at a time. Right? You change two variables, you don't know what change. If you're writing code, you know you write. You know, a few lines of method, and then you test it, and you write a second method, and you test that, and then you put them together in some way, and you test that, right? You always sort of do one thing at a time. And if you're debugging, right, you're always trying to get down sort of the reverse, right? You're trying to deconstruct things down, the simplest case that causes things to break, right? And so, you know, so, so in all these sort of different, you know, in both science, um, programming, and sort of system administration, they're all these are changing, trying to change one thing at a time, right? And that one thing includes things like, did you change the software? Did you change the image? That's the one thing, right? Did I change the configuration on a node or on a link? That's the one thing you changed, right? Did you change the number of nodes and links? That's one thing. Did you change the geographic distribution of the nodes and links? That's the one thing. Those are the other examples, right? And I have a little finger from here because sort of, if you pull out one piece, maybe it won't fall, but most of the time it won't, right? You, but sometimes it'll fall. But if you, but if it does fall, you know that that was the one piece that made it fall, right? But you will never go up and have five people pull out five pieces at the same time, because it would almost certainly fall. And then you wouldn't know why it fell, right? So this is sort of the same thing. Like you change, you know, you cut, add, or remove one thing. All right, so second principle is to start small, all right? So, I would argue that almost always you should start with building the smallest, the smallest possible topology by hand. Right? First, you know, bring up a very small number of nodes, um, you know, and uh, you configure them by hand. Then you figure out how to automate what you just did. Right? You probably can't automate it um, until you figure it out by hand. And then you test things as you go. Right? So you bring up a very simple topology. You automate bringing that technology up and test in your Okay, so some concrete examples. Let's say you have something with client server architecture, and eventually you want to have many servers in the client. Start with one server and one client. That's the simplest thing you can put up that does something interesting. Um, maybe you want to write a controller or do some sort of phone booking. Well, we have standards that OBS image. So you can bring up an OBS switch that you know is sort of fine, right? A lot of people use, and bring up three hosts. And you can run a controller, and you know that's sort of a small quality to sort of get you started. Um, Paul has a nice tutorial that it does do, right? And so it's a master of a couple burgers, right? You know, we need a couple burgers, and then you can scale, make 10 burgers, 
you know, data triggers, uh, things like that. Uh, sometimes surrogates won't like me starting with this one up, right? Draw an example in a minute, she starts with one. And she, um, and that's because she needs to make assumptions as well for a writer or the flavor she needs. But maybe you already have that in the And so maybe you talk about the simple topology that's really, you know, three notes or something like that. So think there's one. Okay. Third thing is always say what you're doing. Okay? So while you're spending on artifacts, for everything that you do that works, right? That means our specs, images, install scripts, custom software, measurements, you know, napkins with scribbles on them, right? You save all of these pieces so you know sort of the last thing that worked. And that way, when something doesn't work, you can sort of figure out why. And also, you can make a good web report if you need to ask for help. Um, version control, you know, this is your friend, right? So you can sort of, you know, let me just keep in track of these things easy. So you should do that. And always know the last configuration that worked, right? That is so much easier for us to help you. It's so much easier for you to help yourself, right? I had three nodes in a book, and I added a fourth and something about that would work. That really narrows my thinking. All right, so that's three things. Start small, change one thing at a time, say what you do. All right, so those are sort of three things. And then, so that's sort of some guiding principles. But then, let's think about this a little bit more. So we have this, with this logo, or sort of diagram of the standard the workflow that we see a lot, right? The nines execute mesh, right? So sort of the most rudimentary experiment, right? And that's sort of the super simplification of the diagram that you know I'm saying that is a little intimidating if you look at it. But basically it's like you're running experiments, there's all the artifacts, right? Our specs, log files, you know, scripts, you know, history, everything, right? And so it's sort of broken down into real detail. And the thing is that this has the original picture that we have that has these loops, right? Since dotted the arrows that come back, right? And maybe there's even more arrows here, right? You do some of these steps many, many times. And the thing that this picture doesn't address, and a lot of doesn't address the first thing we talk about it, is how often should I move, right? How often do I do these pieces, right? And so that's sort of what we're talking about today, right? So, so um, basically, as a general process recommendation, I think this is going to work for most of the time we have for work for that time. We always start with a topology, a small topology, start with as long as one you can, um, that you build by hand as a single aggregate. Then you automate the configuration that topology you can do, then you sort of grow it a little bit, maybe you can some repeats of your time. Then you um, then maybe you sort of interchange finding that you work on restriction and instrumentation. You automate that, you know, when some repeat that's needed, and then you can work on scaling things up, right? If you do the first sort of two columns right, scaling should become quite easy. And Paul has some nice things to say about that, right? Like, if you do the first two right, it really should just be dealing with issues of scale, right? So that means scaling means adding more nodes, but it also means modeling aggregates, and those sort of two dimensions, right? So you can search out that one thing that you want. So we're going to talk about each of these a little bit. Um, so, you know, so, so you always start with small possible topology, still find it as a single aggregate, and you automate the creation. And like I said, keep track of our specs, software, version control. And the tools you want to use to do this are small scripts and custom images. We have several talks in the second half of this session, um, the second hour of the session, talking about how to do that on the SVG and the SVG. And this is also a good time for your other kind of stuff when you're doing right? Because all of it, if you're sitting here and changing one thing at a time, that means you're changing your software a lot, right? So if you have a get repo and then you have to code onto your nodes or check out the repo onto your nodes, how do you, how do you get the software updated, right? What's, what's your plan, right? So you need to repeat those as needed, like I said before. Then you orchestrate which of your uh, experiment. And this is where Jamie Desktop and my page really come to eat, right? They make making sort of kinds of graphs or like levels and we're orchestrating things. Um, it's really, really nice. And you know, sort of here is a good place to automate it needed, right? And so this is when you have little topologies, right? You know, you might have a node, you might have you know, you know, a couple of layers, you know, um, uh, columns, you know, four nodes topology that's sort of gonna scale up to something bigger. Alright, so the second thing is you increase the scale. Right, so 
quickly we might increase the number of nodes, we might increase the volume of traffic, things like that. And so Slack is great for making small scale changes. There's a little copy, I don't know if most people know this, there's a little copy thing. So you have, you know, if you wanted to go from one client to you know five clients, you know, you can copy and add links, and that's probably that's probably okay. But if point notes are getting to this week, they're probably gonna need to do like that. So um and I think this is an area where we don't necessarily have great tools. I know I see has a specific um, tips as I have some sort of emotions that do better with this. And I'm hoping, hoping that Nick is going to talk about maybe Dave. Maybe using Dave to make large policies, maybe? Yeah. Excellent. Maybe not. Maybe okay. something. He's going to say something interesting. Anyway. Um, okay, so um, we have this small thing, this. Um, where we've increased, me, we've increased sort of the scale, and then we start splitting across the aggregates. And I can't imagine a situation, I would almost always start by just splitting it you know, between two aggregates, right? And so you're going to use tools like Stitcher to get your dynamic email stitching. Um, you can also use Stitcher now for retiree tones. XOSM um, does uh, intro XOG stitching. Um, Pretty seamlessly. Um, you can use five of your channels for this sort of regard set of tools here. I'm hoping that they're going to be more than they can type. And then once you get that working on two things, right? Like Stitcher or Jerry channels, like it's very important that people have trouble getting used to work for the first time, right? So figure out how stitching works and how Jerry channel work first and then figure. Um, and so here we have split across two aggregates and two stitches, right? That's probably the key one. So I get to know a little across the technology. And then you know, add more and more. Okay. And then I have a couple of common pitfalls just sort of to toss in here at the end before we move on to the next thing. Um, so don't start with a larger inner aggregate topology. So there's, there's pictures that were sort of the negative places earlier. You know, a couple of them, um, some of them suffer from the, oh my gosh, I can't begin to think where to start, right? If you got, um, you know, 10 or 15 nodes and many, many stitches. You know, is there a problem? Is there a problem with stitching? Is there a problem with custom software? Uh, there's a thousand different ways you can imagine. Right, so don't start large um, or with internet technology, start small. Um, in general, Paul's going to say this a little bit more in a second. Um, if, you, if you're keeping your experiment up because you can't recreate stuff, then something's wrong, right? You're going to have to bring things up multiple times. So you should just embrace that from the beginning. There are some exceptions, like um, Ezra's example where he has this stitch quality that is very hard to get up. Um, like for now, he's working around, maybe that's something the infrastructure should be better. He's working around that now by having that one slice of each one. But, but he still is able to bring up those at the edge. Um, another thing that comes up sometimes is that he needs not a simulator. So that means, like, not everyone is the same everywhere, right? You have you still have you're still getting real compute rooms, real machines, you still have to be configured and code up the ones just like you got a run machine, right? So there's nothing for free. And if you run a simulation beforehand, that's fantastic. That can be real complex that you're you know one thing that we have is going to work. But part of the reason you come to use D is because it's not a simulator and you're still gonna to have to sort of start small and work your way up. Um, to, in order to get things to work. And then I sort of talked at the bottom here, um, this last stitch thing about, um, there's this comment that you have like a lot of control, controller that you're writing in a multi-aggregate topology, but so you have to start, you have to test it in some aggregate topology beforehand. This is like a really common issue, and so let's talk about the original thing about these makers. Okay, so that's sort of some motivation. And as long as I'm going to give us a case study, um, like walk us through exactly how to do these things um, in this particular case. So, and then we have some questions. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm raising my hand. Oh, wait. 
I just like to say this. If you want to learn from a couple of weeks ago, she showed up coming down some of this on some of this work on the machine. Um, but we like asked her like 10 days ago to give this presentation and maybe at 30 to be working. So she's like done all of this in the last week. It's not a conversation done. That is not a conversation we want. That's like an incredible thing that she's even here to be talking about this. So take that to mind. Thank you, Sarah. Um, hi, I'm Sarah Dela from uh, University of Missouri, Kansas City, and uh, I'm currently doing a summer intern at the uh, Thinking Project. So today, uh, in my presentation, I would like to share my uh, experience in the past two weeks that I deployed my experiments on the Gini testbed. Um, before I started with how I did it, I'd like to start with my own research work, what my uh, objective. So. Um, our goal is to uh, study uh, dynamic reconfiguration in that uh, in the virtual virtual network um, environment, so that we can uh, recover the not failure by using um, uh, by by using the um, standby virtual routers. So here I show a very simple for example here. Uh, let's say we have a virtual topology with three routers active activated. And uh, apparently, this router gets failed. So we can remove the virtual router by uh, remove the virtual link. And at the same time, when, when the customer requests requested the virtual network, he, he got two spare virtual routers as a standby. So we pick one of the standby virtual routers and connect it back to the original virtual topology. So in this way, the services won't be. Uh, uh, will be affected and the traffic will be congested on the on the other page. So based on this uh, for example, we can sort of uh, find our goal is to find the optimal um, uh, semi virtual router that will minimize the operation cost and also minimize the uh, resource utilization on the transfer network. So our next step is to define the optimization model that will find such optimal semi virtual router. Based on the model we have, we can uh, based on the model we have, we can sort of design a heuristic algorithm that to select uh, the best standby router to recover the virtual router failure. And once we have the algorithm uh, set up, we want to try out whether this algorithm is good enough, how efficient it is. So we want to try it on a real-time network testbed. So Jimmy is the good option. So our next step is to deploy experiments on the Jimmy testbed. That's what I have done so far um, in the past two weeks um, on the Jimmy. Um, so when we get a larger topology with more nodes and more links, we want to uh, set up a systematic experiment so that we don't have to manually do everything. So in this presentation, I will share my experience with you how to um, start with the first step. Um, once we have the experiment set up, we can collect data and uh, uh, maybe write a paper or a technical report based on the uh, results. So we have done similar study on another testbed um, called the GPE testbed. So GPE testbed is a future internet um, testbed across the US and the Europe. And, um, we we are able to, we were able to um, deploy the uh, latest virtualization on this testbed. So um, the map here shows the GPU GPU network on the US and also GPU network on the European side. So from the map you can see that this is uh, the backbone connection is more like a star or multiple star topology. So from what we learned in the experiment is that. The dynamic reconfiguration is practical, and uh, we can apply this idea to recover a uh, to recover virtual failure. However, the substrate network topology also matters. That will impact, impact some network dynamics in uh, in a point of view, such as the uh, uh, time or the uh, the delay between the two nodes. So, why do we choose the Gini testbed? Um, Gini testbed offer um, a bunch of um, good features that we can achieve. Um, so first, uh, Gini testbed is a distributed geographic um, network testbed, and uh, it 
for every um, node, we can we are able to create customized um, software installation on the VM. And the third, we can create actually virtual topologies, virtual links between any of the VM. We can either create VM kernel, engineering kernel, or station links. And the last is also very important in that the GNU platform technology is more general other than like the star or ring or some other um, specific topology. So this is more close to a um, ISP network topology. Um, so this is um, the something like we want to achieve on the uh, GNU network. We want to create a topology that has multiple sites which shown in different color schemes and uh, we want to have the links that also varies so we have the station links and also the local links between the VMs within one um, one GNU-X so that will give us um, a lot of var uh, variation on the uh, data we want to collect but starting with this large topology will be difficult uh, not only from the setup experiment, but also from the debugging point of view. So we start from a very simple topology from one node. Um, so before I start uh, the step by step, I would like to give an overview on how to um, conduct a uh, systematic experimentation setup. Um, first, uh, based on uh, whatever we want to run experiments, we need to install some software that uh, particular to our purpose. So we want to install the software to one node and test everything is fine, or how long it's going to take uh, to install this software. Once we have that, we can use the smallest colleges to, to achieve the configuration purpose. We want to see how, how difficult it would be configure the experiment and uh, if we uh, and also try to automate try to automate this um, experiment configuration. Once after we have that, we keep using these small link topologies and uh, to validate end to end communication to see if this network is working fine and we can go to the next step, maybe to test some simple measurement. For the measurement point of view, we also want to automate the measurement process. So we want to spend extra time to log into every node and to collect the data. So once we have everything tested on this smallest topology, we can scale it up to a larger topology. To scale it up to a larger topology, not only in terms of the number of nodes and links, and we also want to use as many as uh, Gini Rats uh, we, uh, we need. So two important tips based on my experience is to make one change at a time as Sarah has already mentioned and also um, be very carefully to the version control not only from the software installation point of view but also writing the automation script and also the aspect on the tracking. So now let's start with the very, uh, the very first step to install the software to a VM. So in my case, I want to bring up a virtual router in the network. I chose to use the XORP, that is the open source software, um, to enable a VM to become a virtual router. So on the left side, it showed, I show a little step to install XORP on the uh, virtual machine. It took me about one hour to um, install the XORP, compile, do it, and also verify the installation. So it's not uh, realistic that we want to real-time install XORP on every virtual machine. So what I did was I create a custom image that has XORP already installed. And I create this new, I create a new custom image uh, with the XORP installed and uh, send the URL to this custom image. Once I have this URL, I can easily bring up a VM and to make it as a router that has the XOR running. Um, to refer to how to create a custom image, you can go to this link. Um, this presentation has been already uploaded to the beginning to find out that. Um, the second step is to 
start with the smallest reasonable policy. In my case, I want the policy um, to be small and not particular in terms of every router and not enable to each other. And I want each router to have um, at least two virtual interfaces. So I chose this form of technology so that the top router and the bottom router are not connected to each other directly and each router has at least the two virtual interfaces. So the next step for me was to to study how to configure the OSTF configuration and to start the explore uh, process. For this purpose, I need to get familiar with the OSTF configuration syntax and also to validate the OSTF router once I have the configuration file ready. So these two steps can be automated. Um, I use the shell script to automatically create the OSTF configuration file for every virtual router and the load. Um, and I loaded this automation script by using the postcode script in Flash. I believe um, you already um, know this um, how to use in Flash to load the postcode script. And once we have verified this, we can add the end host to the topology. We added, um, I added a client and a server to the top router and bottom router. And I ran the iPerf to verify the end-to-end uh, -end communication. Um, just to mention that uh, uh, if we have only two end hosts, you can either choose manually install the iPerf or trace route to the uh, end host. If you have multiple uh, end hosts to process, you can take similar steps in uh, similar procedure in step two to automate the installation from the postbook script. Um, once we have the client server set up verified end to end communication, we want to track the routing table update. Um, this is more um, important when we have a failure or there's a uh, topology change in the network. So uh, what we did was we mimic the virtual router failure by filling the XOR process in one of the virtual router. And then we track the routing table updates from other routers. We did two things. Um, we, wrote a, uh, we wrote a very short script to compare the uh, routing table from the previous one, maybe we connected one second ago, to compare if there's a change. We can also display the graphs of the routing table updates by using that. I will show a quick demo at the end of this presentation. Um, so this is the um, outputs for the end-to-end -end, um, validation. I ran the trace route from the server to the client, and also I ran after TCP has between the client and server. So it shows everything with client and uh, from the server it takes three hops from router three, router two, router one to the client. Um, so once we have this uh, small topology set up um, uh, validated, we can move to the next stage. We want to scale it up. So the scaling up can be two dimensions. One is to increase the number of aggregates. So I started with uh, increasing the number of aggregates. Initially, I was using just the one aggregate as four virtual machine created. And on the figure, the figure on the right, I added uh, two other aggregates and uh, I used the feature to create the station link. And I repeated the earlier steps to validate everything. And it shows that I can see I. I was able to trace route from the server to the client, but, and also, uh, oh, sorry. So this uh, two outputs show the trace route results from the single aggregate example and the three aggregate example. So from the delay point of view, we can see the delay only at three aggregates. It shows longer delay than the single aggregate. That makes sense because we have the distance matters. Um, the second dimension of scaling up is to increase the number of nodes within one of the uh, aggregates. So in this example, I increase the 
number of routers in the core network from four to seven routers. And I did similar validation between the client and server by using the trace rules and the hyper test. And this is the routing table update um, along the time um, that's showing from the lab week. So every bump up means there's a routing table change. Uh, I manually bring down the links and the three times the links. So that way I show, uh, you, you see multiple bumps here. And I show uh, the routing table change from the three different routers. Um, once we tested the two dimensions uh, scaling up uh, separately, we can sort of combine them to scale up. Um, we can uh, increase the number of um, uh, aggregates, and at the, at the same time, we, we can also increase the number of nodes within each aggregate. Uh, I haven't done the, this, uh, this step yet, but I, I believe based on what I've done uh, for the previous step, this is very easy to achieve. Um, so what I learned from this experience, um, it's very important to learn the tools first. So before I even started to deploy everything to the genie, including installation, I uh, get myself familiar with the tools, both Slack and Omni to see how to get resources from the DD and uh, test the different commands from uh, by using the Omni um, command line tool. And uh, I try to understand what the uh, physical topology for Gini and uh, compare it with my with the, the other test that we have used we have used. Um, experience with the Gini right? Um, I had uh, some challenges with debugging the post boot script. Execution. So there are some uh, permission privileges problem I have, but uh, as, as, as we said, it's always to start with a small uh, script to test it out. We can just uh, write a very short script that install one uh, one uh, software, maybe Hyper, and test if we can run this automation using the post code script. If that works, it should work for everything. And uh, we can easily get help from the GD user mail list. Um, and uh, the folks there are reply email very quickly. Um, for the best practice, as Sarah just mentioned, um, we have to do version control from uh, different perspectives. Software installation.